Please help me give a warm Georgia Tech welcome, Brad Strickland. Chad Strickland, sorry. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right, thank you uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's quite an introduction to from Ryan there, uh, and thank you all for, for having me here. I'm so excited to join you and, and talk about uh, this uh, interesting uh, topic I've, I've managed to uh, put here on the screen. Uh, as Ryan mentioned, um, let's hope, yeah. As Ryan mentioned, I am a, a proud Florida State University graduate, uh, and I'm actually from Tallahassee, so I've got a lot of fond memories uh, growing up in Tallahassee and, and driving to Atlanta uh, to come to Georgia Tech football games for what we considered was typically an easy win. Uh, but I also appreciated uh, the fact that you guys would remind us uh, the, that uh, we were all going to work for you one day, right? <laughs> and uh, I'll hand it to you. Uh, you were right. Uh, I did work for you guys. Uh, our current CEO uh, is Ron Allen. Uh, he's a proud Georgia Tech alumni, uh, former CEO of Delta Airlines. Uh, I also work for our Chief Information Officer, John Trainer, who's actually in here. Uh, there's John back there. Uh, John uh, was actually the student body president of Georgia Tech a, a long, long, long time ago. Uh, and I was going through our roster, through our uh, human resource information system, to really find out who all of our Georgia Tech grads were. Uh, and I asked John and Ron about them, and it's this guy, George P. Burdell. <laughs> they told me not to worry about it. He said, don't worry about it. You'll, you'll never meet him. Um, so uh, I do have a little bit of, of Georgia Tech folklore in me. I, I know a few stories. So uh, what we're going to talk about, uh, and as you saw, the title of this presentation is Folding Chair Solitaire Mark Wahlberg. And I was asked uh, to talk to you guys really about uh, how uh, important uh, positive sustainable change can be achieved in a, a fairly large organization. And we've got uh, quite a few examples of that at Aaron's. Uh, I'm going to uh, attempt to, to weave this in. I was uh, told by Dory if I created an interesting uh, title that I would get more people here. So uh, I created the title first, and then we worked backwards from there. <laughs> OK, so I want to talk about what we are as an organization. I'm going to talk to you about um, some very specific instances in the company's history. There's actually two dates I can identify that the company had to pivot to make a positive, sustainable change for the company. And then I'll also talk a little bit about myself and my career when I've had to pivot and made, make some um, positive, sustainable changes uh, for me to be able to, uh, to continue uh, to do what I wanted to do. First, let's talk about what we are, what Aaron's is. And as Ryan mentioned earlier, uh, we are a specialty retailer. Uh, we uh, sell uh, and lease uh, appliances, electronics, and furnishings. We also are a manufacturer. We have a manufacturing division called Woodhaven. Uh, where we produce uh, and manufacture a lot of the furnishings that we sell in our stores, as well as uh, other retailers across the country. Now, a lot of questions about what our business really is, and when I say we're a specialty retailer and we're leased to own, uh, it's uh, important for you to understand what we are because it's really the basis for our business model um, is unique. Uh, and it's that uh, we serve a client base uh, that does not have access to traditional credit. Uh, they can't walk into a Best Buy and purchase the necessities of life, like a refrigerator or a stove or a television. Uh, some people think a TV is a necessity of life. Uh, but they can't walk in and purchase those items on credit uh, like uh, a lot of Americans can. Uh, so we provide them with the opportunity to acquire these things, uh, but we do it uh, through trust and through relationships. Uh, we don't run credit checks. Uh, we don't ask anything of them other than to sit down with our associates uh, and discuss um, their personal finances so we can make sure that they can afford the things that they're asking for. Uh, we ask them for three references, uh, and then we work with that customer to make sure that they're going to obtain the merchandise because we want them ultimately to own the merchandise. So it's a unique business in that it's dealing with uh, a segment of our population that uh, a lot of people don't come into contact with, but in reality, it's actually half of America. Uh, half of America doesn't have access to credit. Uh, so that's our demographic, and that's who we're typically working with. Um, we have 21 locations across the country, uh, 700 of which are franchise-owned. Uh, we've got 14 manufacturing facilities. Uh, the primary ones are in South Georgia. Uh, and we've got 18 distribution centers. Uh, we have 12,000, just over 12,000 associates in the company. Uh, we've been publicly traded since the mid-80s. 
Uh, our revenues uh, for corporate-owned stores are just over $2 billion, uh, and we're about $3 billion system-wide if you include the franchise location. So fairly large organization. We're based here in Atlanta. So this gets us to that folding chair. Uh, and in 1955, um, we had a gentleman named Charlie Loudermilk that uh, founded the company, uh, and he did it with that very folding chair. And you would have never thought that you could uh, found a $3 billion organization off of a folding chair, but he did it. Uh, he uh, is a uh, Atlanta landmark. Uh, he has a lot of philanthropic endeavors here in Atlanta, um, but uh, he is something that we're very proud of as an organization uh, and because of all the things that he's done. Now, how did he go about founding the company is an interesting story. Uh, he's a University of North Carolina graduate. Uh, he, uh, his mother actually owned a restaurant uh, here in Atlanta, and after graduating from North Carolina, he decided he didn't want to work in the restaurant. So he got $500, uh, and he partnered with a buddy of his who also threw in $500, and they put an ad in the paper that said, Aaron's rents anything. And he got a phone call uh, from some individuals that said, we've got a wedding. Do you have any folding chairs? And he said, sure, I've got folding chairs, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll rent them. What's the date? Uh, and then he rushed out and bought some folding chairs. Uh, and that was the first rental transaction that he had, uh, and that was really the foundation for the company and what it would become uh, for many, many years. So the company was known as Aaron Rents for a very long time, and uh, it was what we call a traditional rent-to-rent -rent model, uh, meaning individuals rented for a specified period of time. Uh, they had a rental contract, uh, but they never obtained ownership of the product. So it was individuals that uh, were furnishing an apartment for a spe specific a time, uh, or they um, maybe they had a company that they just wanted to rent uh, furniture for, uh, and we would furnish the office, uh, and we were successful, uh, and a uh, very successful business model. Uh, this went on through the, the 60s and the 70s and the 80s. Uh, we continued to grow uh, at a, a pretty steady rate. It wasn't until 1986 uh, that uh, we really can identify the first moment of positive, uh, sustainable change in the company's history. It was at this point that that traditional rent-to-rent -rent model of the business uh, started to decline. And there was an individual, uh, a man named uh, Ken Butler, who was a, a young regional manager here in Atlanta, uh, that approached Charlie Loudermilk and said, you know what, I've got this idea that we could start a rent-to-own division. Uh, and it could uh, focus on a different customer demographic than what we've been focused on. And the model will be based on getting that individual that doesn't have access to credit uh, the opportunity to obtain ownership of the product. Uh, and Charlie gave them the opportunity to do that, and they started uh, the Aaron's Rent to Own division. Uh, and actually went through our, our uh, archives to find some pictures. Uh, we don't do this anymore, but that's a wrestling rink in front of the, uh, in front of the grand opening. Um, I wish we did. It would be interesting. Uh, but this is the 80s. I guess wrestling was very popular then. Uh, but this division started to grow through the 80s uh, and into the 90s, uh, and it became Aaron's rental purchase. Uh, and then ultimately, by the mid-90s, it was Aaron's sales and lease ownership. And it wasn't really until 1994 that this Aaron's sales and lease ownership model really started to click. Uh, and it started to grow uh, substantially. And it was at that point that the company realized uh, if this was the old rent-to-rent -rent model that had been productive, it was starting to decline, and Aaron's sales and lease ownership started to do this. And around 1994 was when they, the two passed each other. So if you think back to that decision to create that division in 1986, if that had not occurred, uh, the old rent-to-rent -rent division, which no longer exists, means that this company would no longer exist. Uh, pretty significant impact uh, by Ken Butler and Charlie uh, Loudermilk to make that decision to, to pivot and change the business model. You can see uh, from uh, our performance, and this is our stock performance uh, from since we went live uh, in mid-80s, uh, it was right around here in 1994 that the company really started to take off. Uh, and that's whenever we really started to grow. Our revenues grew, our profitability grew, uh, and it was all a result of that sales and lease ownership model uh, that, uh, that Ken Butler and Charlie just, uh, started. So this gets us to uh, the first significant change in my career, uh, which was in 2001. Uh, I had been working, uh, and as Ryan talked about, I had gone to law school. Uh, you'll have to uh, forgive me for doing that. Uh, but I did go to law school. I always wanted to be a lawyer. Uh, and I was hired by Celotex Corporation to, to be a labor and employment lawyer. My dream job 
uh, right out of law school. I'd clerked for them and never thought they'd offer me a job, but they did. Uh, very excited, had a big glass uh, wall in my office. Uh, I thought I was a big shot. Uh, and about uh, eight months into my employment, they told me that, hey, we're uh, selling the company and breaking it into pieces. Uh, so that was my job. Uh, I flew around the country and, and laid a bunch of folks off, which was not fun. Uh, and then uh, I turned out the lights on the company. Uh, it was pretty sad and pretty traumatic for me. Uh, but that gave me an opportunity to move to Atlanta. Uh, I came to Atlanta to work for a, a labor and employment law firm uh, that was opening an office here. They were a Boston firm. Uh, and uh, that meant that I actually was traveling to Boston uh, basically every week. Uh, so uh, a kid from Florida uh, that's not used to the cold, spending their winters in Boston was not fun. So in 2001, I met the general counsel of Aarons, a guy named David Rodas. Uh, and uh, he talked to me about this company that he was general counsel of and the fact that he was very concerned because they didn't have a human resource function. And uh, he was concerned from both a compliance standpoint, but also because he had store managers and operators calling all the time saying, help me out. I need some advice on what I should do with this employee. And we talked through it, and I gave him some advice. And he said, you know what? Could you come in and, and talk to Charlie Loudermilk? Uh, I know he'll never have an HR department, but maybe you could talk to him about coming on board. So I said, OK, I, I, I'll do that. Uh, and I, you know, I knew the company, and I knew who Charlie Loudermilk was. So I was pretty nervous when I went in there. And I, I'll never forget, I, I went into his office, uh, and I sat down on a couch. He had a couch in his office. We sat by each other, and he didn't say anything. Uh, and he sat down, and he looked at me, and he said, you know what? I don't like lawyers. <laughs> and I sat there for about the longest 15 seconds of my life. Uh, and the only response I could come up with was, either do I. And uh, Charlie and I hit it off from that point on. Uh, we talked about uh, the value that, uh, that I could bring to the organization, even though he didn't believe in human resources because he was an entrepreneur. He believed that each store manager, each operator, was their own human resource function. They should be responsible for recruiting their own people and developing their own people uh, and making decisions when it comes to, the, to their people. He didn't think that someone in uh, the corporate office in Atlanta should be telling a store manager in Milledgeville how to operate their store. So I came to work for them uh, in 2001. Uh, and one of the first things I did, I, I walked around and I said, you know, I understand his aversion to human resources, but why, why couldn't we develop some kind of HR function to really help the company? And I was told of this legend. Uh, and it was the legend of solitaire, is what I was told. And uh, I don't, John, I don't even know if you know about this story. Uh, but at some point during the 90s, one of Charlie's friends uh, convinced him that uh, he should think about uh, having a human resource function in the company. And they talked about the fact they'll help him hire better people and help him develop better people. So he said, OK, I'll, I'll, I'll take a chance on it. And by the way, this is all legend. I, I don't know if we have any fact checkers in here, whether it's true or not. But this is the legend I was told. Uh, so he hired someone to come in uh, and to start an HR function, at least have one person do that. And uh, this was the early 90s, and we had these new things called computers, uh, which were a major distraction toward working. Uh, I know none of you can understand that, but it really was. Uh, and all the computers, uh, this solitaire game was loaded. And apparently, the legend was Charlie walked in to the, the new HR professional uh, during their first week of employment and saw him playing solitaire. And that was the end of HR uh, at Aaron's, at Aaron Rents, at least for the next 15 to 20 years. Uh, so that's, uh, that's our solitaire legend. So this gets us to um, really looking at when I came to work for the company around this point right here, 2001, early 2002, the, the dramatic growth that uh, we experienced after that point uh, really had nothing to do with me. It really was pure timing. Um, but it was a wonderful experience for me to be a part of uh, the growth that we uh, encountered during that time period. Uh, we literally went from a, a, a few hundred stores to 2,100 stores in just over a decade, uh, a few hundred million dollars in revenue to several billion dollars in revenue, all operationally driven, uh, all about growth and all about cost control. Very little uh, resources were dedicated to corporate support functions because we were an entrepreneur company, and that's how we would grow the company. This gets us to the next major pivot point in the company's history, uh, and that's 2010. Uh, in 2010, uh, I, I believe Charlie was starting to consider retirement. Uh, and at that point, 
he owned 59% uh, of the shares of Aaron's. At that time, he decided to go ahead and divest his shares. So he went from 59% ownership to 5% ownership. His son, uh, his name was Robin Loudermilk, and was my boss. He was the CEO at the time. Robin uh, could, uh, had a, a very unique ability to see into the future, and he was concerned about where the company was headed because we had not invested resources into corporate support functions. It's something that he talked about all the time. And in particular, he was very concerned about uh, hiring the right type of person for our business. He knew that our business was predicated on the relationship with the customer and that uh, it was something that we'd always focused on as a, a small company, of something that we could control when we were small. But as we grew and we got to over 2,000 locations, you can't make sure your store managers are hiring the right type of people to uh, ensure that relationship with the customer is always going to be valued. So very concerned about who we're hiring, concerned about how we're developing our associates. Uh, we relied on operations to do everything. And he made the decision uh, to create a human capital function. Uh, and he said, we're going to do this right. We're going to build it from scratch. Uh, we're going to make sure that we're uh, attracting the right type of people for our business and that we're training them and that we're educating them and that we're retaining them. Uh, we had high turnover at the time and it was becoming a distraction for the company. So this gets us to the next point in my career where I had to make a decision. Uh, Robin approached me uh, and at that time I had been promoted to what we called Vice President of Employee Relations in 2006, uh, which really was just kind of the counseling uh, and legal function of HR. So I was still handling all the legal related employment matters, whether it was litigation or any other kind of compliance issue. And that was really the vast majority of my job. And Robin said, we're going to create this function. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. But I and I want you to head it up, uh, which I was honored by. But he said, but I need you to do something. You got to quit being a lawyer. And so uh, <laughs> that threw me off. I was so excited about the opportunity, but I'd grown up my whole life wanting to be a lawyer. I'd grown up uh, idolizing my Uncle Gary, uh, and he was a labor and employment lawyer. Uh, and he actually was a, a law professor, and, and uh, he's all, it's all I ever wanted to do was be Uncle Gary. And I'd been practicing labor and employment law for over 10 years at that point. And that's, if you go to law school, that's how you identify yourself. What do you do? I'm a lawyer. Uh, so it's all you know. Uh, and so for me to, to think about and consider giving that up uh, was pretty traumatic. Uh, so I told Robin I need to think about it. He said, well, think about this. If you stay being a lawyer and you're a good lawyer, the best you'll ever become is a general counsel in a big company, which was what I thought was pretty cool. Uh, but he said, if you transition to the business side, then you've got a lot more opportunities. The opportunities are endless. Uh, you've got you know, business savvy, uh, and you've got um, passion for the positive side of our business. Being a lawyer is all about negative. You're cleaning stuff up all the time. That's not really what you enjoy doing. So I said, you know what? You're right. Uh, and I made the decision to, to give up practicing law. I uh, went active in, in all the bars. Uh, and It was the best thing I ever did. Uh, but it was a big gamble. I mean, it was a really big gamble for me. Uh, pretty shocking for my family and my friends and all my law school classmates that still can't believe I did it uh, to this day. But my point is, uh, if you wanted to replicate my career, it would not be possible. But it is all about seizing opportunities. Uh, and that was a great opportunity for me to, to grab a hold of. And I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. So this gets into 2010. We went through a pretty significant uh, period of change and are currently going through a period of change from 2011 to 2013. Robin retired. He decided to uh, focus. He had a real estate business. He wanted to focus on real estate. Uh, Charlie Loudermilk retired. Uh, Ken Butler, the chief operating officer, retired after 39 years. We convinced uh, Ron Allen, who I've talked about before, uh, a very proud Georgia Tech alumni uh, and a board member for over 15 years, we convinced him to come on as our CEO. Uh, and this was pretty exciting for us. Uh, former CEO of Delta Airlines understood uh, how to run a business, understood the need for building uh, you know, resources for uh, support functions for operations. And so it wasn't just human capital that we were interested in building, 
Uh, we wanted to make sure that we had an IT infrastructure that could support the stores. We really hadn't uh, dedicated any resources to IT over the years. So we had a point of sale system that was really old, that was struggling to keep up with our stores. We had a marketing function uh, that had been uh, purely executional. They just executed whatever operations decided they needed to do in terms of marketing. We didn't use uh, really any data about our customers to find out what our customers wanted to hear when it came to marketing. So we brought in a new marketing team, a new head of marketing. Uh, we've uh, done the same thing with legal. Uh, we had a lot of compliance issues that we needed to address. We brought in a very talented legal team. Uh, and this is what we've been doing over the last two and a half to three years. Uh, a lot of change for a very successful company. I want to talk about, for the rest of this, just about the change with human capital and, and building an HR function in an organization. First is, I want to talk about is why we did it. And I've kind of addressed that already. We had compliance issues, whether it was employee relations issues uh, or uh, benefits. Uh, we didn't have a compensation function. Uh, there are a lot of just fundamental compliance issues that we had to address with building HR. Uh, the next was talent acquisition. Uh, and really, this is the, the driver for me in my mind where we can really make a difference is we got to make sure that we're hiring and attracting the right people. We want to make sure that we, once we attracted those people and we hired them, that we're able to develop them. Uh, so we want to develop a learning management system uh, that's going to help train them. Uh, a performance management system where they know what their expectations are and that they can be held accountable to those expectations and that they can also receive, you know, for instance, a merit increase based on how well they performed. Uh, these are all things that we had to build, uh, literally built from scratch. And then culture. Uh, it was very important to us as we built this HR function to keep culture in mind. Uh, the culture of the organization was built on this relationship with the customer and this entrepreneur spirit. When you get so big and you don't have someone focused on that, you could easily lose that, especially when you have high turnover and you have managers spread all over the country. So culture is something that we see the HR function in the organization being able to at least help drive with operations. The goal for us in creating this function was to really make errands a great place to work. We want to make errands a great place to work so we would have happy and engaged associates that would be concentrated on developing meaningful relationships with our customers. If we could do this, we can make a significant impact on the business. And that's what we've been working on. So what are the results? The last three years, we've been working very hard at building a foundation. It's not an easy thing to do to build an HR function for a company this big that's never had one. Uh, there have been a lot of obstacles, uh, and we've been overcoming those obstacles over these years. And that foundation that we've built, uh, I'm very proud to talk about because we've been able to achieve a lot of things that companies spend years and years and years working on. We hired uh, a lot of talented people. We've uh, developed a HR field team, 24 people out in the field, dedicated to helping our associates and our managers with employee relations issues and recruiting. We uh, rolled out a new talent acquisition system, uh, which also includes a new brand, a new employer brand. Uh, and uh, we're focused on how we attract the right type of candidate for our unique business. We've also implemented a performance management system, where we literally went and touched every single employee, all 12,000 employees in the whole company, and explained to them what the expectations are for their job and how they can be successful in that job. Uh, this has all been done within the last two and a half years. Uh, I get asked a lot about metrics. I, I wish I had more metrics, but we didn't have any systems to provide us with metrics. We now do. We've now built these systems, uh, so we're going to start being able to track metrics. But one thing, one, one metric we do have uh, that really is the key metric in HR is what is your turnover. Uh, and I am proud to report over the last two and a half years that our turnover has been reduced by 10% annually. When you have 12,000 employees and you have high turnover, 10% uh, is a pretty significant number. And this is just based on what we believe uh, the, the new initiatives that we've uh, you know, been able to roll out, which also includes, I forgot to talk about, benefits. We really focused on uh, making sure that our benefits were uh, comparative to the market. Uh, we uh, gave uh, our associates more vacation time, uh, which was a big hit. Uh, and we really focused on what other soft benefits we could provide our employees to just make them feel good about working at Aaron's. So we've got uh, some good results. We've still got a lot of work to do. Now I want to focus real quick on how. You know, how do we do this? Uh, and this isn't something that you're going to find in any textbook. 
this is really my thoughts on how you implement uh, positive sustainable change in a large organization like this. Uh, it, uh, it could be right, could be wrong, uh, but this is what I believe you have to do. First, you've got to have talented people to help you. Uh, and I've got an amazing, talented team. Uh, the first thing we did was we went out and hired. Uh, we started at the director level. Uh, we hired some leaders to come in from very successful organizations that knew a lot more about human resources than I did. Uh, and they helped me build the team that we have today. And every single one of those individuals on this team are 100% dedicated to building something special. You come to work at Aaron's uh, in the HR function, you're not going to be on cruise control. Uh, we're building every single day as soon as we walk in the door until we leave, and sometimes at night and on the weekends, we're building because we've got 12,000 people, 12,000 families, and 12,000 livelihoods depending on the work that we do. Uh, we've got to make sure that we're doing it right, uh, and we've got to make sure that we're, we're building something that's sustainable. So talent is number one. Uh, it's the number one thing that we focused on, and once you have talented people, uh, you can do a lot of special things. Leadership buy-in. Uh, none of this would have been possible if our CEO didn't believe that it was important and that we could achieve it. Uh, and both Robin Loudermilk and Ron Allen believe in that, uh, and uh, they've been an unbelievable uh, support function for us. Uh, we're very excited to have leaders that, that really believe in what we're doing. And it's not just those two, but it's really leadership throughout the organization. You have trust and, account and credibility. Uh, you know, this is, I think, something that uh, is unique to someone who's been able to build uh, lasting relationships with business partners. Uh, I had worked at Aaron's for over 10 years at this point. Uh, it's been a lot of time with our business partners. We have divisional vice presidents spread out across the country. Uh, those are really the individuals that are running the business. And for us to, to tell them we're going to create an HR function in this company, something that they thought would never happen, uh, they had to believe and trust that we would do it the right way and that we wouldn't do something that, that would not help them or would not benefit them. So we had to have a lot of credibility and trust with our business partners. And that's something I think is unique that you've got to be able to build. And I, I don't think anyone could have come in to the company from the outside and built this kind of trust that we have uh, with, with our business partners. Uh, so it's, it was a unique experience for us. Culture. Uh, I talked about this already. You've got to uh, really evaluate the great things of your culture that you want to keep and know that there's parts of your culture that you don't want to keep. This is probably one of the most critical things that, that I have to do as a leader of this function. Uh, I've got a lot of new people working for me. Uh, and they come from a lot of different organizations. They come from McDonald's and New Rubbermaid and all these great companies here in Atlanta. All, they all have these different cultures that we're bringing in. But it's up to me to make sure that we keep in mind what's made Aaron's great. And what's made Aaron's great is the entrepreneur spirit, and focus on that relationship with the, uh, with the customer. And you've got to keep that, that in mind in every single change that we make. Every single tweak, every single system, every single communication that we have, got to keep culture in mind. Uh, and it's something that I really consider has been part, uh, really, the, the biggest role that I've played in, in doing this. Uh, timing, I talked about the timing. I happen to be uh, uh, you know, in the fortunate situation where I came into the company uh, during a, a great growth period. Uh, I was able to, to really uh, work with the founder and, and chairman and, and our chief operating officer very closely. Uh, you don't get that opportunity many times in life. Uh, and for us to get to the point where we had grown uh, so dramatically without dedicating these resources to support functions and then having a leader realize it's what we needed. Uh, it was totally timing. But at the same time, it was an opportunity. And opportunities were presented to me. Uh, and I took those opportunities. And a lot of times, I see people that have opportunities presented to them that they don't take. Uh, and it's because it's hard work. It's really, really, really hard work to do this kind of change, to implement this kind of change. It's not easy. Uh, and if the opportunity is presented to you, I, I, this is the one thing I would uh, relay to you all. Uh, if you want to make a difference, if you want to make a change, you've got to seize that opportunity because uh, you don't know when the next one's going to come along. Commitment. Uh, I felt like we needed to show commitment to the cause uh, immediately. So the last thing I wanted to do was tell the whole company that we were going to create an HR function, and then it'd be several years before anyone really felt it. 
So we immediately hired uh, some talented people to come work, and we immediately rolled out major initiatives that every employee in the company felt. So within that first year, everyone had felt the associate resources function in the company. I felt that was very important because I wanted to build that momentum. I wanted uh, associates to feel like it wasn't just talk, but we were actually uh, going to do what we said we were going to do. We were going to make Aaron's a great place to work. So we had to show that commitment early, and we had to show it often. Courage. Um, I was talking to one of my colleagues uh, last week, actually, uh, and she's actually done something similar to a large company here in Atlanta. And we talked about, you know, what was the biggest, uh, scariest thing that you had to do when you rolled out this change? And we both said, it's courage. Uh, we both agreed at the end of the day, uh, you have to be prepared to lose your job to implement positive, sustainable change. Uh, and you've got to be prepared to deal with the consequences of doing that. Uh, and you're going to meet resistance. Uh, you're going to have obstacles placed in your way. But if you really want to do it, and if you know it's the right thing to do, which I believe it is, then you have to be prepared to, to lose your job. I mean, it's just the way it is. You've got to have that courage. Uh, luckily, I haven't lost my job yet. Uh, but, uh, but I think that's a really key component on how you can make an impact and how you can develop sustainable positive change in an organization, especially one this big. So let's get us to Mr. Wahlberg, right? How in the world uh, does Mark Wahlberg fit into this discussion? I like to think about companies. I like to think about individuals uh, that have managed to uh, change themselves uh, in a sustainable way. Uh, and I know as millennials, you guys all know Mark Wahlberg as Mark Wahlberg, uh, the great actor, uh, producer, um, uh, you know, uh, 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 writer, he writes. Uh, he does all these great things. Uh, but as a Gen Xer, I know Mark Wahlberg as Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch and the brother of Donnie Wahlberg. Do you guys even know who Donnie Wahlberg is? Uh, <laughs> okay, exactly. Uh, so, this is what I grew up with Mark Wahlberg, uh, and if you would have told me 20 years ago, Marky Mark and the Funky Bunch would have ever become what he is today, we would have all laughed at you. But here he is, he constantly worked on uh, making positive changes in his life to really develop his career. And that's just like a company. There's so many companies that have done the same thing. You look at Apple. Apple was making computers just like Compaq was 30 years ago. Compaq doesn't even exist anymore. You know, Disney was uh, you know, making movies, and now they, uh, they do everything. Uh, so I like to think about Mark Wahlberg as a great example of someone who's made some positive sustainable change that we could also do at Aaron's uh, to have made changes uh, in their uh, histories. So where does that get us to? And that's really the destination. I get asked this all the time. I get asked this by the people that work for me. How long is this going to go? How long are we going to build this? I get asked by people outside the company, you know, what's the ultimate goal? Where are we going? Uh, and I recently got asked uh, a very interesting question by a consultant uh, that uh, is working on a project for us that kind of stumped me for a second. She asked me, she said, if Aaron's didn't exist tomorrow, what is the one story that you could tell that really defines its legacy. And it took me a few minutes to think about, but I told her about this charity uh, that's in Marietta, and it's a small charity that provides um, a, a place for abused children to go, uh, and it provides a place for abused children and their mothers to go when they have no other place to go. And we recently partnered with them as part of our leadership development program uh, to build bicycles for these children. Uh, so we get all our leaders together and we build bicycles. It's a, it's a great team building event. I finally went out to the facility um, not long ago to, to, uh, to visit it and see you know, what it looked like. And uh, I hadn't been there before. So they took me on a tour. The director took me on a tour and she showed me a facility. Uh, they had wonderful furnishings in there. Uh, they have counselors there for the children. Uh, and, um, you know, it's, it's something that's it's pretty touching whenever you see these families coming in there because, you know, they don't have anywhere else to go, and this is their home until they can find somewhere else, you know, to take them in. We went through the tour, uh, and she said, you know, we've got actually have a long history with Aaron's. Uh, and I said, you do? I, I didn't know that. I thought we'd just start partnering with you. And she said, 
No, whenever we founded the company uh, many, many years ago, before you started working there, uh, sorry, founded the charity, uh, we didn't have a whole lot of money. But we knew what we wanted to do. We wanted to provide a safe place for, for families to go and for uh, abused children to go. Uh, so we went to Aaron's. We went to the local Aaron's store to help us with furnishings. And, and we went in there and we said, we, you know, we really hope, we want to start this charity. We really hope that, uh, that you can you know, give us a discount on, on some uh, furnishings. And the store manager said, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll give you a discount. Uh, go around and, and pick out what you want. Uh, and then pick out you know, what you can afford and, and, and anything else that you think you might want. And, and we can talk about it. So they went around and, and picked out uh, the furnishings that they thought they could afford, and then they picked out the furnishings that they would love to have had. Next day, uh, the, the truck pulls up, and they unload everything. Uh, the furnishings that they wanted, plus the, what the, the things that they really wished that, that they could have. And the director said she's you know, nervous, and she, she went up to the manager and said, well, we didn't really talk about price. I'm not sure if we can afford this. And the store manager said, don't worry about it. It's on the house. Uh, this is uh, considered a charitable donation. And she got pretty upset. We all got pretty upset thinking about that store manager because we knew, uh, in Aaron's, we knew that that store manager had the power to do that. He didn't have to call Buckhead. He didn't have to call the corporate office and ask whether or not he had that permission to do that. He was allowed to do that. And that's part of that entrepreneur spirit, part of being in the community uh, and being part of the community that, that we serve. So it's, it's really two things. It's two parts of our legacy that I think we've got to make sure that, that we keep in mind. Uh, when we're making these change. You know, we want to keep the great. Uh, and the great is, you know, uh, we represent uh, the opportunities that entrepreneurship brings. Uh, we represent the opportunities that entrepreneurship brings for our associates, for uh, the customer we serve, but also for our communities. And the second thing is, we're a business model that's serving a community and a customer base that other businesses don't let alone would they base their entire business model on it. And we're not only basing our entire business model on serving this, this customer, but we're also basing it on trust. We're not asking for credit. We're not asking them to do anything more than make a commitment to pay for the product over a period of time. And so when I think about our legacy, when I think about what we need to keep, that's it. Uh, and that's what our goal is going to be as we develop not only this human capital function, but all the other changes that we're making going forward. And I'm very excited about our future. I'm excited about what we're doing and, and all the, the talented people that we have working for us. So I would be in big, big trouble with our recruitment team if I didn't show a talented uh, group of Georgia Tech uh, students at least one recruitment video. Uh, so I want to show you one video. It's only a minute long, I promise you. Uh, it's something that we just rolled out this year. But you're going to see how it incorporates that theme of relationships uh, into uh, the type of individuals that we're recruiting. We went through a pretty extensive process. We asked all our employees, what, why do you work here? I thought they were going to tell us I work here because it was a job and you pay well. Uh, instead, they told us the reason I work here is because I like the relationship with our customer. I'm from this community. I know what our customer is going through, and I appreciate the service that we're providing. And it's why the customer comes in every month, and I have that relationship with them, and that's why I work here. So you'll see that theme as we go through this. One minute video, and then we'll open up for questions. How does that sound? All right? Turn up the volume.
All right. <laughs> Thanks. Okay, so I'm in big trouble. We've got 16 minutes for questions. We're supposed to have a lot more time. Uh, so I, I guess we'll open it up for questions now. Go on here. All right. You touched on this already a little bit, um, but you mentioned a lot about attracting the right type of employment. And considering Aaron's specialty and your client base, what would you say is the right type? Of employment? Good question. So it depends on uh, the type of job we want to fill. Uh, and as you saw from, from that video, that's really focused on store operations, so working in a store. Uh, typically, the individuals that we want working in a store are individuals that, that live in the community that they're serving. Uh, and it's individuals that um, are happy. Uh, that's very important. Uh, it's individuals that um, are engaging uh, because Again, they're dealing with customers. It's not like retail where you walk into Best Buy, you buy something, and they never see you again. This is literally a relationship where they're coming in every month to make a payment. And you're also working with the individual customer to make sure that they can afford the products. So uh, you know, it, it's a happy, engaged individual, uh, someone that, um, that understands how important that relationship is. The corporate office, um, who we're looking for right now, uh, and I think I touched on this a little bit. It, it's someone that wants to build something, because uh, that's really what we're doing right now. Uh, it's someone that is engaged uh, in creating something special, uh, someone that understands uh, big picture, uh, not only what we're doing as an organization, but what uh, the particular function, whether you're working in IT or marketing. Uh, it's a lot of hard work, uh, but it's someone that I think has to be fully engaged in uh, doing meaningful work. Uh, and that really, when I sit down to talk to someone, that's what I'm looking for. Does this person really want to do meaningful work or do they just want a job? Okay, another question? Yeah, I know you've already talked a lot about um, building out an HR function and all the components that go into that, but what would be your best piece of advice for someone who's really passionate about organizational change and wants to go into human resources? My best piece of advice. It would be uh, work in an HR function that is strategic and not administrative. Uh, and I see this a lot. I see uh, a lot of HR functions that unfortunately, no matter whether it's, it's the culture or the leadership of, of the HR function, uh, where they view themselves as just administrators. Uh, they're either processing payroll, making sure new hire paperwork's filled out, uh, they're not engaged in things like what is our, our employer value proposition for candidates? How do we convince people to come work for us? How do we uh, make sure that we're developing a performance management system that's going to help drive the business? That's very strategic. Uh, and so if you want to be part of that, you need to ask a lot of questions about what do you do every day? Uh, and what's the long-term strategy? We're, we're working on our strategy all the time. Right now, we're really working on a, a five-year long-term strategy on where do we want to be and how we're going to get there. So if you asked us that question, we'd be able to tell you. Uh, you'd be able to tell pretty quickly that, uh, that we're, we consider ourselves a strategic business partner, not just an administrator. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. I guess it's you, you lease them the furniture based on face value or, or uh, I, I don't understand, you know, in this day and time with the housing bubble that we've just gone through and all the foreclosures on homes and everything and people being out of jobs and everything, how you can let your inventory go out of there just on face value and as a follow-up question, how much do you have to foreclose on and repossess, and how do you handle that? Uh, you, you definitely sound like an investor. We, we've heard that question many times. Uh, and that's the uh, unique part of our business and, and what's made us successful. It very much is a transaction based on we're asking you for three references. Uh, we're going to call those three references and talk to them, uh, make sure that they're legitimate. Uh, we're going to talk to you about your finances, make sure you can't afford it. And then from there, you're signing a lease agreement. Uh, and you understand as a customer, if you can't make the payments, 
uh, we're going to work with you. Uh, if you miss a, a month, we're going to work with you. We're not going to come out and pick up the merchandise as soon as you miss a payment. Uh, but we also ask from you a commitment. Uh, and uh, that's a discussion that our general manager has with every single customer. Uh, so it's, it's the value of that general manager in the store is really what drives that, that piece of, of the business and, and why it's so surprising for individuals to think, you're not running a credit check. What's to keep everyone from just leaving? Uh, and we certainly have write-offs. Uh, I don't know what the, the write-off percentage is, but it's, it's fairly low. Uh, you know, most, uh, I think around half of our customers end up obtaining the merchandise long-term. So they end up purchasing it, purchasing it long-term. And, and we're very happy about that. I mean, that's, that's our whole goal is to get the customer to ownership. There's other rent-to-own re, uh, retailers out there that that's not their business model. They want to maximize the value of that product. They want get, to you know, get it back and lease it to other people. That's not what we do. We, we want to make sure that the customer gets to ownership. I know it's a, it's a crazy concept. Uh, it really is. And that's what makes our, our, our story, I think, so unique. Mm -hmm. Is there something? Oh, I'm sorry. Is, oh, I'm, is, there's a question over there. Yes, I have a question. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you for speaking with us. Um, my question is regarding something you mentioned earlier about um, how you reached out to all of your employees regarding the culture changes and um, your newest HR function implementation. So what did that look like for someone like you um, in terms of reaching out to employees, or what did that process look like? For, you said you reached out to each individual employee, so I didn't, was that more of just like an automated message or no. reaching out to them personally or et cetera? Right. So that, that uh, talented team of HR professionals I said we had, uh, we told them uh, in March uh, that they were going to travel to every single store in the company and they were going to sit down with every single employee and they were gonna, they were, what we were doing was rolling out performance management system. Uh, I, I was expecting half of them to walk out the door uh, whenever we said that, but they didn't. They said, bring it on, let's do it. Uh, and so we literally had our HR team go into every single store. I mean, we traveled from really March uh, through uh, August, uh, and uh, we rolled it out. Uh, and what it meant for me, you know, how, how I've communicated, and I'll, I'll tell you, communication is a challenge for us because we have all these locations across the country and we have, uh, and this is a challenge for all retailers, we've got individuals uh, in these locations that you don't have a direct way to communicate with them. They don't have email. So we don't issue email to store associates typically. So we rely a lot on our general managers. Uh, we rely a lot on our company intranet. So every time they log into the computer, they see a message. Uh, but a lot of it was just face, face-to-face -face interaction. Uh, I do uh, a lot of interaction with our store managers. We have a national managers meeting, several thousand people there. I typically talk to all of our store managers about these concepts and what we're doing. We rolled out the employer brand to those managers face to face. Uh, so uh, it's um, it, it's a challenge uh, and it's a lot of work, um, but uh, but it's fun at the same time because you get to meet all your people. Okay, Chad, have a question. Yep. Yeah, Chad. So the how, when you're talking about the how and, mm -hmm. and the ingredients, one of the critical ingredients is courage. And you had cited that you need to be prepared to lose your job. Right. Have you actually ever been confronted with that? Or is it that the courage that you have has meant that that's unnecessary? Um, have I ever been confronted with that? This is being webcast live, right? Um, I, I don't know. I, I've been prepared. Yes, I've been prepared to lose my job to do what's right, to, to implement the change. Um, I have uh, uh, certainly uh, encountered um, significant obstacles along the way that, that made me feel like I had to take that stand. Uh, and uh, it was the right thing to do. Uh, and luckily, I had leadership at the very top that, that would support me, ultimately. Uh, but uh, it's, it's uh, something that in your mind, you think, if I roll out this initiative, if uh, I do something that we're not used to, how's the company going to react to it? Uh, what if it doesn't work? What if it actually uh, becomes a distraction uh, and uh, affects store operations and, and our performance goes down? Uh, that's something that weighs on your mind all the time when you're making these really significant decisions, uh, like rolling out a performance management system or a new talent acquisition system. But if you know it's right, uh, then you just got to do it. You just got to go with it. And uh, I certainly have been presented with that, that decision many, many times. Hi, Mr. Yes. Strickland. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the most significant challenge that you faced while building the HR function in 2010 
and also maybe a few of the steps that you took to overcome that challenge? Sure. Uh, the, the most significant challenge uh, was the culture challenge. Uh, again, this was uh, an organization that uh, literally one of the mantras was, we will never have an HR department. Uh, I mean, that, that was like, you know, when there was a cheer going on, it was like, yeah, yeah, we're all, uh, we're all Aaron's uh, and we'll never have an HR department. Uh, so uh, it was thinking about how do we change perception of what an HR function could do. Uh, in their mind, a lot of the operators and the business partners uh, saw human resources as that administrative function or that police function that's going to keep us from doing things that we need to do to, to get our business accomplished. So how we overcame that, uh, a lot of discussions, a lot of education, a lot of trust, a lot of uh, let me explain to you, what, what's your most significant challenge right now, uh, business operator? And they would say, hiring the best people. And we'd say, well, when do you have time to recruit? And they'd say, well, I don't. I have to run my stores. And we'd say, well, that's what we could do for you. Uh, you tell us who you want and who you think would be successful, and we'll go out there and find them for you. That way you can focus on your customers and you can focus on operating your stores. A lot of interaction, a lot of discussion. Um, and it was, uh, it was a process. I mean, it, it really was a process to go through that. What else? I yes. actually have a two-part uh, question that uh, relates to uh, reputational issues. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the first is, was the big um, sexual harassment finding against the organization in which you were quoted as saying it was a runaway jury, which mm -hmm. I understand the press might have gotten it wrong, yeah. was that an important uh, reason for um, embracing the human resource uh, function as a protection mm -hmm. for the, the organization? That's, mm -hmm. that's the first. Okay. Are you right, on the second one too? Sure, I'll, okay. I'll remember. Okay. The, the second one is, uh, in terms of the, uh, the culture stuff, I'm, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about um, how you describe the, the culture, because um, you know we've uh, read recently about the FTC uh, spying um, fine spyware case, Spy, yeah. Uh, yeah. and you know how does that fit with the um, you know w w with your, you know with your uh, culture? Does it extend to how you embrace your? Customers as well as your employees. Yeah, I understand the question. So uh, the first one, uh, so everyone knows, we had a, uh, a sexual harassment case uh, uh, where we had a significant uh, verdict against us. It was actually $95 million uh, in St. Louis. Uh, and uh, the, co the um, company ultimately, well, the, the case, the verdict was overturned by the judge, and then the company ultimately uh, settled the case for around $6 million. Uh, the timing on that, because I get asked that a lot, we actually had started developing the HR function before that case uh, went to trial. Uh, and um, whether or not it was further catalyst for what we needed to do, it probably was. Uh, and uh, we knew we kind of, well, we already had developed kind of a game plan on where we wanted to be and, and uh, how we wanted to develop the function. And then the case happened. Uh, so it, it helped catalyze you know, what we wanted to do as an organization. Uh, the second piece. Uh, there's pending litigation uh, regarding that FTC case, uh, and my general counsel would absolutely kill me if I commented on it. I would love to comment on it. I would love to discuss the, that with you, and, and hopefully one day I'll be able to. Um, but uh, maybe you could have maybe you can have me. Yes, yeah, exactly. Have me back, and, and I'll talk to you about that. John would love to talk about it too. Unfortunately, uh, we actually talked about this, uh, you know, because uh, we've been asked a lot about that recently, uh, and a, a lot of companies are facing the same challenges with privacy and security. Uh, that's something that we have dedicated a lot of resources to, um, making sure that we're in compliance. Uh, and um, it's something that, that we're working really hard on, but I can't comment on the case right now. Gotcha. Okay. Thank okay. you. Right. So I have one final question. Now that you're three plus years mm -hmm. into this developing the HR function at Aaron's, and surely you got uh, benefits to show from that. Do you think Charlie Lallenbrook has now changed his mind regarding the importance of human resources? I hope so. <laughs> uh, I haven't talked to Charlie. So you haven't talked to him about Yeah, I haven't talked to him lately. I mean, he retired um, uh, over a year ago now. Uh, but uh, I, I think he, 
he would. Uh, he already had uh, before he tired. I mean, Robin had talked to him about the importance of it. Uh, Charlie was there. He was still our chairman whenever we made the decision to do it. Uh, so he understood the company has changed. The company has grown. Uh, we're a really big company. Uh, and uh, just like the, the things that, that Terry was just asking him about, there, there's things that, that HR could help us avoid and help us make sure that we're going to be sustainable in the future. So I think Charlie agreed with that. One final question. Have you been caught playing solitaire at work yet? <laughs> never. I would never play solitaire. I don't even have the game on my computer. I don't have any games on my computer. Uh, our IT uh, and security uh, group is very good. Last thing I want to do is be caught playing solitaire. Okay. Jeff, thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it.